Uh, hi, I'm Maggie Stieber. I'm an American uh, photographer. I'm a documentary photographer. Uh, I've uh, worked in 64 countries around the world. I've done a variety of things uh, from covering wars to fashion uh, to portraiture. I'm one of those photographers who likes to do a lot of things and I'm very happy to be talking to you today about my work. There are all kinds of photographers um, and some people specialize. Uh, a documentary photographer or at least let's say that the way that I define that is somebody who can do a number of things. But generally speaking, we photograph issues, uh, important things that are going on in society, uh, in politics, uh, trends, that sort of thing. For example, an issue could be about hunger. Let's say that you wanted to photograph hunger. So you might want to concentrate on children, you might want to concentrate on a particular economic group, uh, maybe it's more about nutrition. When you work on a documentary project, uh, there are so many ways to tell the story, you could have different chapters. So in chapter one, you might look at hunger in children. Uh, in chapter two, you might look at the kind of food that people are eating. For example, you could do a whole story on fast food you know, the McDonald's and Burger King and all of those things that actually aren't very nutritious and really make people fat, but they don't give them the nutrients they need. And that's why people get fat, because they're still hungry. Another issue could be um, certainly poverty. <clears throat> there are many more poor people in the world than there are rich ones. Uh, but you have to decide photographically how you're going to tell that story. And that's to me, the most exciting part. The hard part is to get access to things that you want to photograph, but the most exciting part is deciding how you're going to photograph those things. And, um, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. This is the freedom of photography, actually. I photograph uh, mainly for magazines. Uh, and although I also have my own personal projects uh, that don't necessarily get published, but it, these are things that make me very happy. But I work a lot for magazines, and my main client uh, is a magazine called National Geographic. So when I do a story for them, this is very much like uh, beginning a documentary project, because when we get an assignment from the magazine, we being the photographer, uh, we have to do weeks of research. We have to do research online, we look at magazines and books, we have to call people to interview them to see if there's something really worth coming to photograph. Uh, we have to decide what we're going to photograph. Uh, we work with a picture editor on that sort of thing to cull it down because you, again, you can't go and photograph everything that exists about a particular subject, so you have to photograph the key elements. And that takes research, and that also takes picking up the phone or emailing and talking to people about what they do or where you find these things and how accessible is this. Photographers are not just people who take pictures. We're people who ask questions, and more importantly, we are people who really listen. I have uh, so many favorite pictures, and I have to say that um, over time it changes, but my very favorite picture is a picture of my mother uh, sleeping. Uh, I call this picture Sleeping Beauty. And um, my mother uh, was a scientist, actually. Uh, and um, around the age of 76 or 78, she started to lose her memory which is a sad story uh, for anybody uh, who experiences that. Maybe some of your grandparents are going through memory loss. But the most wonderful thing happened during this experience. And it was that I got to see my mother in a whole new way. So that I was able to step out of this mother-daughter 
relationship, which is sometimes very uh, difficult. Some of you might have this going on in your lives. I think during the teenage period of your life, it's very tough sometimes with your parents because you are becoming who you are and they still hold on to you as though you were their baby and, and they have a certain way of seeing you too. So it's a struggle, right? But during this very sort of sad voyage that I had with my mother, and I'm, a, a, I'm an only child raised by an only parent, um, I started to see her in a whole new light and it was very liberating for me because we had a very fractious relationship. Um, and suddenly I was able to see her as her own person and I fell in love with my mother in a whole new way. I, I really began to see her as Madge, as who she was and not as my mother. And this was so wonderful and it allowed me to photograph her in ways that were very loving and very beautiful. And, and I took so many pictures of her. And in fact, I ended up doing a very big project on my mother. Um, not for any reason except that I spent so much time with her when she was losing her memory. And sometimes there's nothing to do. You know, people sleep a lot. Sometimes they're not able to speak anymore. They, they can't walk, you know, as they grow older. And so there's just an awful lot of downtime sitting around. And so I started photographing her. And I came up with all of these magnificent pictures and I put them together in a, in a multimedia show called The Bright of Passage. Um, and this has been seen by thousands of people and I get so many emails from people who were really helped by what uh, I show them through my experience and what I learned. But I love this picture of my mama sleeping because she's lying on her bed she has a little stuffed kitty that she's sleeping with. Her skirt is spread out. I think it's so beautiful. My mother was half Cherokee. That's an American Indian tribe. And, and in this picture to me, she looks very Indian. Uh, so I really love it. Um, it's my favorite picture. I stood up on the bed. Uh, so I, I'm looking down on her. Um, and I took about 15 or 20 pictures because sometimes I was looking through the viewfinder, but other times I was really trying to hold the camera up and over her directly because that's a different angle. And it's, we call this a Hail Mary because you're basically saying, please work out, <laughs> you know, like, anyway. Um, so, you know, you're just trying different things because you can't really see what you're you're looking at but um, but I tried different angles I even got down off the bed and I shot you know I took pictures of her face and just I went all around the bed and this is what you're this is what you call working a situation I know several photographers who have used Instagram to photograph issues wars um, any of the other things that they like to photograph and they've published books so just because you don't have a camera doesn't mean you can't be a photographer. Sometimes people are a little bit threatened by a camera or, you know, they, they're, they're not so trusting. But everybody has a phone. Everybody's using this to take a picture. And so it's very familiar and it's very comfortable for people. And it's not an imposing machine, you know. So this is not a bad thing. There's a New York Times photographer, Damon Winter, who covered the war in Afghanistan using his phone. He took his cameras, but he noticed that every time he would raise his camera, the soldiers he was photographing would become very stiff and uncomfortable. But they were all using iPhones to photograph each other. So he just switched to his iPhone, and then he was really one of the guys. And he became able to take very intimate photographs. So this is not a big deal. I photographed my mother, and that's a very intimate, personal story. But the truth is, as a photographer, I am always asking people to be vulnerable in front of my camera. I have asked hundreds and probably thousands of people to let me come into their lives. And I believe very strongly that we also have to be vulnerable, we photographers, and sometimes show what's going on in our lives. Um, and this photograph of this young man uh, uh, in Haiti, it's uh, the funeral for his mother. This young man uh, was writhing in pain <clears throat> when the 
they finally put the last um, bit of dirt on his mother's grave. And uh, just this moment occurred where he rose up in this terrible cry, and I, I got the picture. So this is a very private moment. It's a very sad moment for this family. And here I am, a photographer, sticking my camera in their face. Um, how dare I do such a thing? But the way that I got this picture was that there were many, many funerals. So many people were killed. There were many funerals going on at the churches. And so I went to one of the churches where there were five funerals going on at once. And I sort of looked around and I decided there's a family. I'm going to sit down and talk to them. And because I speak French and I speak Creole, that really helps. Uh, so I sat down and I just very quietly started to talk to a family member. And I asked who had died, what was going on uh, when they died, was it related to the election violence. And, um, and I told them how sad I was to hear that it was a woman who was killed, an older woman, and somebody's mother. And would they mind uh, if I came along to the burial? Because I'm a journalist and I, I'm trying to tell the story of what has happened. So after the funeral mass, I went with them to the cemetery. And I was photographing the whole time, photographing, photographing, right in front of them. But as I said before, um, it wasn't until this last moment when the last bit of dirt went on the grave that this young man really rose up in pain and screamed. And that was the only time he did it. And it was, it was like it happened and it was over like that. And fortunately, I was photographing the whole time. You always keep photographing in a situation like this because you never know what's going to happen. I took one frame. I only got this one frame. And I call it Mother's Funeral. And uh, it's won a lot of awards, but I think it, it signifies something more than this woman's funeral. Because to me, this is the whole country of Haiti, which is suffering so much um, for all kinds of reasons. And uh, so it becomes a picture not only about the death of somebody and the burial of somebody and the loss of somebody in a family, but it becomes a representative of the struggle of a whole country. And that's when photographs of a particular thing can become what we call a metaphor for a larger idea. And if we can make photographs like that, sometimes you tell the story of many through the story of one. I want to say this about captions and titles for photographs. These are so important. A really great caption can sell a terrible picture. Um, but What's more important is that if you want people to understand what's going on in the photograph and you want it to have some real meaning, you have to write captions. And in a caption, it tells you who is in the picture, what is going on, who, what, why something is happening, where it's happening, and when it's happening. Every time you take a picture, it is an historic document. This is documenting history, a moment in time. And you have to tell us what's going on. It is so important. <laughs> okay. All right. Now I'm going to make sure this wave file works because if not, we have to do it all over again.